When I did an interview with uh, Liberation, uh, the editor said, don't you know this, French ter this is French territory? And I said, oh, yes, there's Polynesians all the way down from Exxon, Provence, Carcassonne. They <laughs> pop out of the woodwork in the Loire, Loire Valley. You know, you see them, they're doing the Polynesian dances in the back end of the Loire Valley, uh, in the wall city of Carcassonne, in the lovely humidity of Aix-en-Provence, there are Polynesians everywhere. <laughs> well, faint if we hear that again, that this person is an ideas person, not really out of the mould of most politics, just a common or garden liberal, just a common or garden conservative right-wing hack who will, try and, who will try and besmirch an honest man's reputation to uh, an honest person's reputation for just people cheap political advantage. Now, Mr. That's, now, that's your position. You've asked these questions knowing nothing. You know he had got 50,000 and you knew of the bond report, but you asked these questions for two weeks. That's what you did. You fraud. You disgraceful, disgusting fraud. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Order, order, order. Mr. Deputy Speaker. And there are people wandering around saying that the GST is not a goer, not a goer, our friend from Brisbane, uh, a member for Ryan, the member for Ryan, principal among them, understands that the Liberal Party was a black hole for the state Liberal Party in the in the in the suburbs of Brisbane after uh, the election, and that the GST is Order. not a goer. You got the member for Bandalong wandering around saying, "Look, I was only given one go at the leadership," <laughs> and uh, and the member for uh, Kuyong was given two goes. Oh God, here Order. he is. The old Order. country yokel up again. Order. The Prime Minister. Uh, that there's a lot of uh, dissension on the other side of the House. And uh, as, for the, as for the point of order taker, if he's out here up trying to outshine the, outshine the leader of the National Party, he's only got to be on his feet and dressed to do that. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Richmond said was given to you on the 23rd of October. Was it advice given to you orally? If so, from whom? Or was it advice given to you in writing? Yeah, yeah. The Honourable the Treasurer. Yeah. Oh, tut tut, Sherlock. Tut tut. I mean, Mr. Mr. Speaker, really, to try and I mean, look, how desperate are they? W A Inc has fallen apart because we've established the real W A Inc's over there, with the old, with the old established, with with red, not red Fred, dead Fred, dead Fred, dead Fred, dead Fred as he's been called by his colleagues by around the. Uh, uh, well, the member for Pearce. <laughs> I know. I mean, the message had gone out on you, John. They'd put a contract on you, old boy. They'd put a contract on you. The Goldies had put a the Goldies had put a contract on you. And 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 what's more, they made it. They made it. And uh, and I, they only came unstuck when Crow Magnon got out there bragging about it on television. Of course, with the Country Party. I mean, it's very interesting getting this question. I mean, if ever the most proven corrupt party in this country is the National Party of Australia, yeah. the cr proven corrupt party. Order. Uh, and uh, I mean, half of the former Queensland cabinet is in jail. And uh, Mr. Speaker, and we've got the leader of the National Party up asking. Uh, uh, Mr. Order. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we've got the leader of the Order. National Party up asking questions about issues of propriety. Don't make us laugh. The price of a car declined because wages went up in 1980-81 under the wage explosion delivered by you know who. <laughs> Your two mates here. And uh, and of course uh, he always turns around when I drop one on him. He can't sort of <laughs> can't psychologically handle it. Uh, and apologise for it. And remember, I sang Advance Australia first before God Save the Queen. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Too obvious. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, did you hear a little right of that question? The embarrassment from the leader of the National Party, and well may he be embarrassed. Well may he be embarrassed. Up there singing the national anthem of another country. Up there singing God Save the Queen at the Monarchist, uh, the Monarchist dinner. Uh, and he's got the temerity to get up and ask me questions about what I might say abroad. Now, Mr Speaker, I'll tell you what I won't say abroad. I won't be arguing that a foreigner should be Australia's head of state. That's what I won't be arguing. As the Leader of the Opposition is arguing, and as you are arguing, and you compounding it Order, the member by for more. singing the national, the national anthem of Great Britain. You don't, have to be, you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to understand that all of Durack's statements were as a result of his visit up and down St George's Terrace and around the gold mining company. And the same would go for Shaq and for Tucky 
The same would go also uh, for Cheney, who has always presented himself as a, an upright, decent citizen mm -hmm. after truth, justice and the Australian way. No, yes, no, no sit down and cop it. Uh, sit and cop it. You can dish it out. Sit down. Sit You're not in charge of this place. You're not in charge of this place. You sit and cop it. Order. You're not in order. charge. Order. 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 You're not in charge of this place. Order. We, still, we still have a speaker who presides over the House. We actually got a written undertaking from the Liberal Party that they wouldn't impose a tax on gold. Interesting, interesting. And we have these vociferous press statements by Senator Durack. All of that time, oh, of course, he's never run into a gold miner in St George's Terrace. He doesn't know any of the gold mining companies. He's never had any, any, any conversations with them. They've never asked the gold mining industry for funds. Pigs. Pigs. Of course you have. You're guilty and you know it. And you're just now hoping like hell this commission doesn't well, get on the back of you. And because that's what will come out. I mean, you've been at it. All the ramps in the, in the tax system existed in the first place because of your dishonour. And, they, and they've stayed there until we took them away in all of these deals you always made with these sections of industry. But, Mr. Speaker, solicitor with a modicum of police court competence. That's what we've got. That's what we've got here. And, and, uh, and he talks about. Oh, come on, Rosie. Give us, give us a go. Give us a go, darling. Give us a go. So, how can you make the claim that there's no strategy? I mean, how do you just stand up and say a thing like that? Even if you say the strategy's wrong, that I'll cop. If you say the strategy's wrong and I've got a better one, I'll listen. But when you get up and say there's no strategy, I regard you as a fool. A fool, right? Which is, of course, basically what you are. No, I'm asking you. Why should you've made the claim? You've made the claim. Why should microeconomic changes be announced in a budget statement? Why? And in which way was their absence? In which way did their absence diminish the value of the fiscal statement brought down last night? I mean, in intellectual terms, why? Oh, listen. Interject. Tell me. <laughs> That it was an opportunity. You could have presented. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. In other words, in other words, you're making a political point. Tested, tested. You made a political point. You didn't have an intellectual point because we know it's, of course, trite trying to hold the discipline of it all together. And you must go home at night when you throw your cheap speech around here and hop back into your little flat around here and pull out a novel, thinking, "Thank God he's in the job. Thank God." <laughs> Thank God it's him and not us, because at least he can run the place <laughs> and hold wages together. Just a week ago, we had all the sort of all the confected bonhomie wheeling in the fight back case. But little did we know, Mr. Speaker, when they put the knife into it, they were really putting the knife into it. <laughs> I guarantee you, Mr. Speaker, in one press statement, he had the word listing 23 times. 23 times. Listing. He's listing everywhere. Listing. Come in, come in. He's listing. <laughs> Hearing side press conference in Double Bay last Sunday, we had the truth. Any <laughs> socks, yes. yes. Order. He'll tolerate fluff on the navel, Order. but he won't the tolerate sand in the toe. He was in his Order. socks. And there is no social policy, there is no economic policy. I mean, even Mr. Speaker, I mean, I keep it in the drawer. But even, even the act we fight back. <laughs> Even Acme Fightback, Mr. Speaker, had at least some coherence about it. I mean, That's not what you said last year. I've come to love this thing, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, but here we are. Now oh, I know there's some things, you know, that get, that get to you after a while. It's going to be replaced by a GST, yet you say the GST wasn't modelled to produce the two million estimate. I mean, what? I mean, how, talk about lying straight in bed. Brother, how do you do it with these sort of things? I mean, fancy putting. There you are, there's your picture, there they are. And what about you? Oh, oh goody goody, you. You've got your picture on the back too, the member of the National Party. I mean, you two would say anything to move an inch. Would say anything. Would say anything. Political stunts, suggesting in that in interest rates were going to go up after the election. In fact, they went down by five percentage points. And then saying we're going to have double digit inflation by the end of 1990. Professor. Professor, God help your students. God help it when your students start wreaking their economic havoc on the rest of us. If that's the best you could do, if that's the best you could do. So the fact of the matter is, well, I obviously learn them better. Oh, than the rest. I'm surprised, Mr. Speaker. I'm surprised that uh, Laura Tinkle 
even implied any of this because when I because uh, because because when I resigned as treasurer in June 1991, there was a tear and a riot at the press conference. <laughs> there was, and I was I was both, Mr. Speaker, touched and flattered. 13 percent of GDP, the 22 percent of GDP. The member for Mayo you know knows I mean? better. Well, that poor silly fellow. Uh, he more to be the member for Mayo. The member for Mayo, Mr. Don't Speaker. Push it. More to be pitied than despised. Now, <laughs> look at the, debt in the, the table and graph in relation of debt to GDP, and you'll see that the debt villain is no other than J. W. Howard, sitting over there, the member for Benelong, who wants a long task of adjustment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Order. I mean, <laughs> Order. You, you guys have got more front than Mark Foy is getting up asking. <laughs> There was, a time when, there was a time when I had a better relationship with a member for Benelong than I have today. In those early years, early days after 1983, he was always jaunting through the corridors, uh, engaging you in brisk conversation at any turn, discussing uh, any of the policy changes which were denied to him. And I used to often wonder why he was so jolly and so jaunty about his demise. And the answer was he was more clever than I at the time gave him credit for. He knew what he had done. <laughs> and so had, so had his accomplice, the, the leader of the opposition. And what they did was hope like hell someone else could get us out of the problem. Mr. Speaker, Prime Minister, the Minister, of Minister for Australia Resources a demonstration of intellectual incapacity and sterility, <laughs> they've had it from the leader of the National Party. That is the dead hand representing the dead hand that was laying upon Australia for most of the post-war years, the lowest common denominator politics from, from the country party, the conservative rump of the, of the conservative forces in Australia. What we see is a question that wouldn't go around or two at a Labor Party youth conference. That wouldn't, that wouldn't cut the mustard at a young Liberal Party barbecue. <laughs> Deputy Speaker, I know the Leader of the Opposition is always about to leave when the heat starts on his, uh, for a bit of heat. To help the rich, why go through the ruse of a consumption tax? Just knock off the tax-free threshold. What's that? Order. Oh, is that right, Fred? Order. You're always, you've always, I mean, Order. The, always, member, the, the member for Pearce won't interject and the Treasurer shouldn't respond to the interjections. Uh, Oh, that was his first. I thought I'd give him a bit of a uh, reception, but it was pretty dull, I must say. I asked the Prime Minister, when will he put the interests of the nation above his own political survival and restore a proper system of cabinet government to this country? Yeah. The Honourable yeah, the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, you see, Order. Mr. 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 Uh, cabinet government like there was in his time, where they walked in and got knocked over every day, he said, in BRW, we would walk in, he said, Mr Howard and the advisers, with hopes high to be knocked over by some anecdote that had come from the non-members bar the night before from the National Party. <laughs> so, so after having laboured for a year to bring out the accountancy of the GST, we find that the econometrician most associated with it says it will actually reduce GDP. Well, well done, well done, Professor. Well done, Professor. Well done. Most ominously, Murphy finds that a GST would retard economic growth for the first five years, but contribute slightly to growth after the end of the decade. Oh, beauty. <laughs> beauty. 2001. We see a sort of blip on the GDP scale. This woman for the Leader of the Opposition, Dr Hewson, pointed out that the Coalition's proposed micro-reforms to make waterfront roads and other things more efficient might generate substantial economic growth. <laughs> See, but when you have a look at their micro policy, when you look at the micro policy, it's micro by name and micro by nature. <laughs> You'd need a looking glass to produce it by 15 million. <laughs> They're going to leave road funding at the same level as 91 too. Of course, you see, as the GST, in the morning at the hotels, as the GST is collected from travellers as they book out and the great collections hit the register, the train line going from Sydney to Melbourne will miraculously straighten as it goes around the curve. <laughs> and, when, and when the cost of dry cleaning bills are paid at 10, the bridges will lift to take double stack containers as they go along. 
I mean, this is the sort of transition. We're, we're going to have a Cecil B. the mill transition of the infrastructure and GDP as a result of GST. And yet, this is proposed by the Leader of the Opposition as the way forward. This is the plan for Australia, a plan to go backwards. <laughs> What, what else is there to say? What else? 